Evening all, we're at the BMW Edge Federation Square. It's the only venue I've ever been in which looks like it's going to masticate me. It's the most awe-inspiring piece of avant-garde architecture. And as I was walking here along the Yarra this afternoon, I uh, heard a noise behind me and I realised that something had slithered out of the Yarra. And it was, in fact, a huge crocodile. And it had a clock ticking inside it. And I recognise this crocodile from childhood because it is, of course, the crocodile that J.M. Barry tells us about in Peter Pan, the one that masticated one of the arms of poor Captain Hook. And Captain Hook had this sort of reptilian variation on the Damoclean sword following him for the rest of his career after the other arm, with the clock going tick, tick, tick. So there's a sort of a three images or metaphors for mortality in one the abbreviated uh, arm, the crocodile, and the clock. So Cook, the croc, and the clock haunted me as a child, and they're here tonight again, because we're going to be talking about matters of life and death, and how, um, how you can create a morality, a sense of ethics, out of what may be to you, by no means to all of us here, a meaningless universe. Lots of things to talk about, and let me introduce the people who are going to do the talking. Amanda Laurie is a novelist, of course, and a sometimes political writer, a very good political writer in my view, whose books include the award-winning Camille's Bread, Camille's Bread, and most recently a collection of stories titled Reading Madame Bovary. Amanda has written about sexu secular rituals, about births, deaths, and marriage for the monthly. This young fellow here is Julian Burnside, AOQC. He's one of the last cluster of QCs, I guess, aren't you? What are you now? An SJ or something? Or no, 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 but new ones, new ones are SC. It's just I'm the old currency still. Yes, you're old. I money. get to hang on to it. You're pre decimal, right? Yes. Okay. Now, Julian is a barrister in the field of commercial law. Uh, he became a, a hero of mine because of his. Um, bold roles on behalf of refugees, asylum seekers, his great and memorable attack on certain shock jocks who will remain nameless like Alan Jones, and in what little spare time he has, he's also an author of books for kids and grown-ups. Tony, Tony Cody is our token god-botherer. He's a former <laughs> journalist and philosopher, the founder and director of the Centre for Philosophy and Public Issues at the, Mel at the University of Melbourne. Tony's written widely, and I would say wildly, about politics, ethics, morality, and the philosophical connections between those topics. And he was telling me in the green room he's recently had a mild altercation with Richard Dawkins, and I have some sympathy for that because although Richard is a fellow atheist, he's an incredibly abrasive and humorless fellow. Welcome all of you, <laughs> and let me also extend the welcome to the Gladys and the Poddies who listen to the Little Wilders program. Okay, I'm going to ask each of you this. Tony, do you fear the crocodile? Do you fear death? Um, well, I think everybody fears death, or pretty near everybody. I think it's a very deep uh, psychological um, instinct in the, in the human species. The philosopher Thomas Hobbes built a uh, pretty much a whole ethic and political philosophy around the fear of death. I don't death. want to hear about Hobbes, I want to hear about you at this stage. <laughs> well, I'm just associating myself with good company, I hope, you know. Uh, so the idea of dying, the idea of um, ending it all, uh, is something mostly people approach with apprehension. Not everybody, of course, because certain things can happen to you that make death preferable to going on. But mostly we want to survive. I once heard a uh, a philosophy talk by a young man uh, when I was in South Africa on the stoic attitudes to death which tend to say that we shouldn't worry about death and he began his talk by saying I like it here and I think there's a lot in that you know I mean I think that it is actually something to fear in a way the departure but I do find that as I get older I fear death less and I fear dying more when no, I was in young. In other words you're concerned about the mode of death that yes, it might be yes. painful or um... Well, not only painful, but deeply undignified and um, uh, drawn out and so on. When you're young, I think you're mainly thinking about accidents, you know. I don't want to 
fall in front of a car and so on. But when you get older you, and you've seen more people die, I think that's the process that starts to dominate. I became obsessed with death at the age of four and five when I discovered it. And that bloody crocodile's been keeping pace with me ever since. <laughs> Amanda, had, do you fear death and if so, why? Or yes. why do you mainly fear it? I, I fear death. Um, but like Tony, not as much now as I did when I was young. I think when you're young you have a sense of entitlement and you're haunted by the idea that you might die young and miss out. You won't have your fair allotment mm. and this won't be just and reasonable. You won't get your fair share. And then once you get to a certain age and you think, well, yes, I've had a reasonably good life or at least I've had my, a reasonable allotment of time. So then you start to think about death in a different way, I think. And as Tony said, you start to think about how to die mm. and where you're going afterwards, if, if anywhere, um, and what kind of funeral you want and who you don't want to have there, and in, <laughs> in particular what music you most definitely don't want played. Um, <laughs> and you start to leave a I would, have, I would have thought you want to have I Did It My Way sung <laughs> by Frank Sinatra. I think that's one she doesn't want, isn't it? <laughs> No, no, no. I think like Gough Whitman, you start writing long and complicated wills, you know, control freakery across every detail. I told you that off stage. I've read about that. <laughs> you naughty. <laughs> but okay. I've done it as well. Julian Burnside, AOQC, how do you feel about RIP? It doesn't worry me in the slightest. I don't fear death at all. Uh, I'm a little bit with Woody Allen that I don't want to be there when it happens um, <laughs> because the manner of dying does worry me. I, I don't want to die slowly and painfully. I do not want to die in a way that is undignified or horrible. But the idea of being dead doesn't trouble me in the least. Have you always had this equanimity about mortality? I think so. I think so. Um, you're I, a very I, rare character. Ooh, that's telling me that I'm here. It's handy. Um, Let's console him. Uh, he's calling. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, no, I, look, I, I just don't see the problem. I, I, the idea of ceasing to exist doesn't worry me at all. Okay. Uh, I wouldn't, wouldn't mind if I had some assurance in advance that I'd get reasonable reviews. You know, I'm reminded, Clarence Darrow, the great um, American trial lawyer, uh, once said, I've never killed a man, but I've read a number of obituaries with great pleasure. And, and I'm not sure that I'd want my obituary to uh, inspire pleasure in people. I now would like to ask you this. I never had a scintilla of religious belief, although I really would have liked it when I was five years old. It would have been something of a comfort. But I, Tony, what's, what's your spiritual journey? Have you always been, uh, had a religious conviction? Uh, yes, I'm a, I'm a Catholic of, uh, really? of, of the kind that probably wouldn't be acknowledged by the Pope. <laughs> um, uh, I, I fall in that category they often refer to as liberal Catholic. Um, so uh, I'm a bit hard to predict on what I... Uh, believe and don't believe. Um, I can go into the detail of that if you like, but um, this conference in Oxford where I met Richard Dawkins, after I gave my talk, someone got up and said, oh, you're a cherry-picking Catholic. Another fellow said, yes, you're a supermarket Catholic. And I said, well, you know, I don't know about you. He was a rather large man that asked this question about the supermarket. I said, I don't know about you, but if I go into a supermarket, I'm very careful about what I buy and eat. You perhaps go in and eat the lot, but that doesn't seem to me very rational. So I think this cherry-picking thing is a bit of a red herring. I think it's just a, an issue of rationality. You know? you're, you're, you've raised the, the Catholicism issue now for hundreds and hundreds of years. Catholics lived in dread of death because mm. they might mm. have been sent mm. down to this terrible place. Yeah. And, uh, you know, with the rest of the Liberal voters, and I wondered... Uh, <laughs> Yes, I think they're there, yeah. But to me, Catholicism, for most of its existence, didn't actually soothe people about mortality because no. it confronted them with the last judgment. Yeah. Yes, I think people think, who think of an afterlife, and it's relevant, of course, to the question of death, uh, often think that um, it's an easy, consoling idea. But, of course, in the history of Christianity, it's um, been connected with the idea of judgment. Uh, so the options are not always particularly attractive, as you say. Um, I myself don't actually believe in that sort of hell, but um, uh, certainly quite a lot of people do or did. Amanda, mm. has religion filtered your thoughts about death at any stage in your life? 
Only in childhood, um, when I had a religious upbringing, but that was a very long time ago. Um, what brand of religion, might I ask? Catholic. Good on you. <laughs> Um, it's a very useful upbringing because it inculcates a habit of self-reflection, also scepticism, eventually. Um, I'm a positive agnostic. Uh, I think we're all profoundly connected in a vast plane of unified consciousness. I think when we die, our energetic selves, something happens to that energy. Energy has to go somewhere. Um, we're not machines. Where it goes and what happens to it, I don't know. I'm interested in all the theories about that that the Buddhists and uh, Vedantists have. But basically, being an old-fashioned empiricist, if I can't see it, hear it, feel it or touch it, I'm not prepared to pontificate on it. Nevertheless, I have had personal experience of a profound interconnectedness, which you could call, in a post-secular sense, secular spirituality. And that seems a contradiction in terms, but in fact it's a new and emerging field of exploration, um, where people are neither dogmatically religious nor dogmatically atheistical and open, they're simply open to possibility. Okay, Julian, what about you? Were you born into a family of God brothers or did no, you? No, no, no. I was born into a, a non-religious family, but I went to an Anglican school which took religion fairly seriously. And I took religion pretty seriously. I, I deferred being confirmed for one year, so I was unfashionably late in being confirmed because I thought I had to understand what I was doing. And I then used to go to communion every Sunday until about the end of matriculation when I began to think, this is all bullshit. This is, how, how do they expect us to believe this stuff? I, couldn't, I really couldn't understand at that point how we had been conned into believing things that were demonstrably unsupportable. So um, religion and I part of company. But as, as um, someone once said, Anglicanism is good because you don't actually ever lose it. You just forget where you put it. Uh, um, and I think that's an advantage Anglicans have on the Catholics. But now I'm a sort of resolute agnostic. Um, I remember one, agnostic. Night, one night on the program I had three extraordinary women all prominent in their nation's politics. One from the US, an African-American woman who'd opposed the war on terror, almost alone in so doing, Carmen Lawrence, and I'm ashamed to say an English politician whose name escapes me, but she was a dissident during the, um, the, the Tony Blair years. And each of them had a similar attitude to social justice. And I asked one of those questions you shouldn't ask because I didn't know the answer. And that was, I was trying to work out a connection between them, and all three were lapsed Catholics. And I've decided that lapsed Catholics, rather than RCs, LCs, are one of the most powerful groups on the planet <laughs> because they bring with them, if you like, the, the morality mm. Or, mm. or the notional morality of true Catholicism, mm. but they dispense with some of the harsher dogma. Yeah, I think it's a regrettable that religion has had such good press because. Religious dogma especially seems to have had a, a more malignant effect on the world than just about any other force you can identify, whereas a framework of moral beliefs is fundamentally important, and religion does not have a stranglehold on it. Well, that's, that's what we're here to discuss, how we hammer out a belief system, a value system, mm -hmm. for life, mm -hmm. if we don't necessarily believe in the... Um, in a meaningful universe, and to me it never has had meaning, but you try to scribble some subjective meaning onto your little blackboard against the great blackness of time and space. Uh, do you acknowledge, Tony, that it's possible to create an ethic without any religious impulse? Oh, absolutely. I, I'm always rather amazed at uh, people who think it's not possible. I mean, the, the, uh, uh, some of the greatest uh, philosophical figures in, uh, in the history of thinking about morality uh, had no religious input into it. Um, Aristotle, notably, Confucius, and other. Um, insofar as there are vaguely religious things in the background, they don't figure in the accounts they give of what it is to good, lead a good life. And indeed, in Aristotle's case, the account he gives is one that's, is one that's taken up by Christianity in the Middle Ages and later. So it's, it's undoubtedly possible. I, I, don't, I don't think there's a... I'm amazed that people even you know, say it's not. But I do find quite a few atheist friends who are very anxious to say you can have an ethic without religion. So people must have been bashing them over the head, you know, saying you can't. Tony, it happens all the time. I get 
half a dozen go. letters or emails a week yeah. saying that yeah. I cannot possibly have a moral basis to my life or yeah. any other atheist because I lack well, this divine spark. Well, the, I mean, apart from anything else, the Catholic uh, uh, theological tradition has always held by this rather strange idea of natural law, but I think it can be given a, a sensible account, that you can work out all sorts of important things about morality by natural reason alone. Um, there are some things that might require some belief in God. I mean, whether you've got an obligation to worship obviously requires belief in God. And there may be some other ways in which religion impinges on morality, but the idea that it, that it is wholly dependent on religion seems to me just false. You, Amanda, describe a feeling which uh, I would characterise as a sense of the numinous, and that's a word I've nicked shamelessly from theological vocabulary, mm. because it's something which unites, I think, everyone. Have they got any soul at all, any brain, to walk out at night, look up at the sky and mm. sense the eternal and the infinite and the astonishing, the astonishment of it all. But when you are feeling your current strength of conviction or at least a strong possibility of this unity, does, does it come from Catholicism to any extent or did you wipe that and start again? No, it's a purely subjective experience. Um, everybody owns up to the numinous, even Richard Dawkins, um, certainly Christopher Hitchens. I, most atheists own up to the numinous, they just define it in non-traditional or orthodox religious terms. The point about the experience of a meaningful universe is that it is largely mystical, it is largely subjective. It's difficult to explain and you can't impose it on other people and you can't uh, evangelise um, for it or against it. And if someone has it, you can't argue against it. You can't tell them that their experience is wrong or inaccurate. And so for that reason, you should always be working off a basic position of respect for the other person's experience. I think that's absolutely primary. One of the things I don't like about the so-called new atheists is their contempt and their sneering um, and often shallow dismissiveness of other people's experience. It's not a good basis for a negotiated consensus in the social and community sphere. If someone should tell the missionaries that, shouldn't they? They should, absolutely, and they're, they're absolutely as much to blame and they occupy the same position and as many people as have observed the new atheists to the mirror image of fundamentalist religionists. Mm. The, Julian, you belong to a profession which is greatly reviled, as you know. In fact, when I was collecting jokes for the Penguin Book of Australian <laughs> Jokes, 90% of them seemed to be bashing lawyers. Uh, but you have redeemed the entire profession in recent years. I'm sure they'll be grateful for that. Well, you know, I'm just <laughs> being awfully nice to you here, but the fact is you are driven by morality. I can't think of anyone in your profession quite as driven to live a moral life as you are. Oh, I think that's over-pitching it, to be honest. Um, I, I, it's true that um, ethical thinking has um, shaped a lot of the stuff that I've done publicly, but I don't regard myself as any more or less moral than anyone else in the profession or in the community at large, and I really hope no one imagines that I've Would you swear that, that on the Bible? <laughs> well, that'd be meaningless, wouldn't it? <laughs> I, I, I would solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm that I'm no better or worse than anyone else when it comes to morality generally, but, you know, I try to do things that yeah, my morality I, tells me I have to do. I, I was just going to pick up on something Amanda said, um, because I think we need a couple of distinctions here that typical philosophers move. Um, when she said that morality was subjective, um, I'd want to... I'd, I'd no, I didn't say morality was subjective. Well, I, I said wondering. the experience of a meaningful universe is subjective, right, which right. is a very different thing. Right. And that's the difference I wanted to point to, because mm. you introduced it by talking about meaning. Um, there's part of morality which is, and partly what I was talking about, is uh, about various obligations and duties and, and uh, permissions and so on. And there I think it's, uh, it's capable of being perfectly objective. I think it's possible to defend some of the positions that um, Julian, for instance, takes into his public life uh, by argument and reason and appeal to experience and understanding and, and to some degree emotions. I'm immensely but, relieved to hear that too. <laughs> <laughs> well, I only said some of the positions. <laughs> yes, I know. <laughs> but that's one area of morality. But then there's another kind of area that's more connected with the, the spirituality and, and so on and things of that kind. And that's often to do with certain sorts of ideals or uh, aspirations or choices of, of style of life 
which can't be said, you know, I, I'm doing it this way so everybody else must do it the same way. Um, that can be a very important area as well. It's open to reason as well, but not as securely as some of these other things. I have to identify what's going on under the auspices of the Wheeler Centre. We're at Federation Square in Melbourne, and this is doubling as a late night live, and my guest, my guest in discussing the morality of mortality are Amanda Laurie, Julian Burnside, and Tony Cody. A question I want each of you to think about. How, at the end of a life, does one judge a life? The crocodile has come along and it's, it's taken its final bite and you're lying there and you're looking back on your own life. How would you, you, Tony, judge your life? How would you, would you judge it by its high points, by its mean average, by... Yes. You know? Very hard question. I, I think one of the crucial things that one would want to look back on was just how much love there'd been in your life and how much you'd been an agent of, of love and of restoring um, and helping relationships amongst people and how much you've actually contributed as well um, to the public good in some small way. You know. um, of course, you'll also look back at all the horrible misjudgments and mistakes and uh, active acts of vice that you've fallen into, but, but with a bit of luck, there'll be more of the other that you can look back on. And that's, I think, one of the things should be aiming to achieve. And that's how you judge the life of another, I suspect, is it not? Pretty much the same yeah, sort of process. Yeah, yeah. Love would I, be important. Yeah, I, mean, I, I, I think that's one thing I do take from Christianity. I mean, that it's, a, it's not something that would just come naturally out of uh, Aristotelian reasoning, for instance. I do think it is actually a contribution that the, that the scriptures have made. Amanda, another society that had something to do with crocodiles was the ancient Egyptians, and they had no real written law, but they had the concept of mind, where on death your heart is weighed against mm. a feather, mm. <laughs> and that decides the afterlife. Mm. Is that the way you would feel when you're judging your life, weigh your heart against a feather? In other words, would you pick up too on what Tony says about love? Well, I, first of all, I wouldn't judge anyone else, not because um, I have a moral position on that, but because I can't know what they've really done in their lives. Ever since Sarah Dowse told me the story about how Malcolm Fraser secretly saved the women's shelter in Queensland against Bajelki Peterson's predations, I've realised that you should be very careful um, what mm. you say about anyone, unless you're under the bed or living in their pocket. That's the first thing. Um, I wouldn't bother judging myself. I think that's a Christian notion of repentance, and it's about looking back. And um, dying should be about being fully in the present um, and making, it sounds absurd, making the most of that experience because you haven't got any other choice. You might as well. <laughs> uh, and it's a waste of time to look back, unless you have a Christian notion of repentance for the past. Your turn, Julian. Yeah, I, well, I, like Amanda, I wouldn't try and judge anyone else's life. And um, I'm not much interested in the idea of suddenly stopping at the brink of the abyss and assessing my own life. But I do think seriously, first of all, I start with the proposition, life has no particular purpose. I do not see it as being part of any grand plan. And so, you know, doing the best you can is a pretty important um, guiding principle. And I, I quite like the idea that what you do for yourself in your life dies with you. What you've done for other people lives after you. And if there's any sense at all in which I believe in the notion of immortality, and broadly I reject the idea of immortality, but the, in the limited way in which I believe in it, it's this, that if what you do in your life lives on in the memory of other people, then to that extent you live on. Uh, you can do it by bringing up your children wonderfully into being marvellous people. I think that's one of life's great achievements. You can do it by contributing to the general good in one way or another. Uh, it really doesn't matter which path you choose, but the real question is, have you done something which benefits other people rather than benefiting yourself? And if so, will then perhaps, for a generation, the sense of what you were might live on. And if that matters after you're dead, well, terrific. Tony, your response to what we've just heard. Oh, I don't, I don't have a lot of uh, 
disagreement with that. I, I do think, uh, well, the way you framed the question was, how do you th consider your life and think back on it? I don't think that's an unnatural thing to do. I mean, it is a good thing to live in the present uh, in all sorts of circumstances. But I, I wasn't thinking of repentance particularly, though you might have some things to repent. I was thinking more of just what sense you had of how your life had gone. And I think some of the things that Amanda and Julian have said would be consistent with what I said. I don't, uh, as for uh, immortality, um, I think the um, I think it's very deep in the Christian uh, tradition that there is some form of survival of death, uh, some form of afterlife. But I think most of the images and pictures that go with it are just ridiculous. Um, and I think that uh, St Thomas uh, and many and the, and the classic theologians uh, do say that our language is amazingly inadequate for describing anything to do with God and with godly things. And uh, religious people frequently forget this, I think, and come out with very confident assertions about all these things that are very hard to justify. So I think it's something of a mystery what survival would be. Amanda, do you have some hint of an afterlife? One of the last things that Manning Clark ever said to me was that I have a shy hope. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's yes. a very lovely phrase, I think. Yes. Um, no, as I said before, I don't know. I don't know. That's the do, you, do you have a, a shy hope? Um, I have a curiosity. There's no point in hope. Um, I'm curious. Uh, but I, I don't know. I really don't know. And I don't think it's important to know. Someone once uh, asked Graham Greene when he was uh, very old uh, precisely this question about the afterlife. Did he still believe in an afterlife? And he said, look... The question, uh, the issue has lost interest for me. I used to have a lot of interest in it. Uh, now he says, soon I'll know one way or the other, or I won't know at all. <laughs> yes, uh, exactly. Uh, well, Julian and I are in the you won't know at all category. <laughs> <laughs> this is it. You may be surprised, Philip. You may be surprised. I'll be furious. <laughs> it, it, it just means, it just I'll means that you won't, it just means you won't recognise us. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try to. Or maybe you won't be allowed to speak to us. <laughs> One of the things that makes it different for a group of Australians of our eras to discuss this is that most of us, most Australians of our era, have been denied a lot of direct access to death. The last century, what, 150 million died in wars and genocides, and mm -hmm. all over the world people saw a lot of bodies. Mm -hmm. I keep meeting people in their 50s who have never seen a corpse. Yeah. They look at them voyeuristically or people holding their breath on television, which is pretty much a culture of death in so many ways, but they don't, in fact, know directly of death right. because it's now secret. Mm. It's now mm. something that's mm. dealt true. with euphemistically mm. behind screens in, in hospitals rather than the, mm. the grand tradition of sitting around the deathbed or, as Bruce Petty points out to me when he spent a couple of years in Southeast Asia, where everything is public. You hear mum and dad making love at night. You see her belly grow big. You see grandma die. You see her dead. All of that is there on show. Mm. It's not on show so much for us. Well, it? Sex and bodily functions are the taboos that have gone. Death is the remaining taboo. It's, it's now mm. probably mm. The, most, the most taboo subject available. People hate the idea. And you're right. We don't see dead bodies. In the past, in, in previous centuries, people would see their grandparents and their parents die in the house and they would see their bodies laid out. And of course in Muslim societies now they have a ritual washing of the body so they're all accustomed to the idea of a corpse. For us it's horrifying. And mm. in, in India they burn the bodies in public. Mm. So that, um... I want to conduct a poll here because we may be wrong. In the audience here, would you raise your hand if you've seen a dead relative? So wow. you were wrong on the basis of this poll, <laughs> overwhelmingly wrong. Well, it, you will it, draw 19th century audiences. <laughs> <laughs> it it, it may be a bad sample. The ladies and bodies, that, that is entirely erroneous. Everyone here is young and fresh. 